Alrighty guys, so somewhere further down the line, you're going to have to deal with multiple bits, and it's also called a bus. So multi-bit bus. So what it means is that if we go back to our regular knot, right here we're in the knot 16. So in our regular knot, we can only operate on one bit, right? So here's the gate diagram. Here's one bit coming in and one bit going out. So the 16-bit variations just mean that we're going to operate on 16 wires coming in and 16 going out. So visually, you can imagine 16 wires coming in. So that's one, that's two, and I'm not going to draw all 16. But you can imagine it would look something like this, except 16 of these, right? Okay. So, where was I? Oh, yeah, okay. So for the not 16, uh, someone's going to pass us 16 bits. Someone's going to plug 16 bits, and it's our job just to knot them over. So here is a variable called temp. It holds 16 bits, and our job is to just take it as the input, right? Not 16. Someone's going to call it. We're going to take their temp, plug it into this chip, right? Into this end, and we're going to produce an output that is the knot of the 16 bits. So how do we do that? So it's pretty straightforward. What we do is that we take a regular knot gate. And if we go back and look at the knot.hdl, we'll see that it's API. It takes an input wire called in and an output wire called out. So we're going to plug something into those in, out. OK. So now in the local context of the knot 16, we also have variables called in and out, but it's different from this one, right? So on the right hand side, it most likely always refers to a local variable. So what I mean by local is that in right here, right? This in will refer to this over here, anything in here. The left hand side is just the name of the wires. So hopefully that makes sense. So we're going to plug uh, an input into the NOT16, to the regular NOT, I mean. So as I said earlier, a NOT gate only takes one binary input, right, one bit. And here we have a 16-bit bus. So how do we take out one bit from the 16-bit bus? Well, the syntax is the name of the variable with, with square braces, and then a number, which is 0, through n minus 1, where n is the width of the bus. So 15 will get us here. So what we need to do is that we need to take the first bit of the 16-bit bus and plug it into this regular NOT gate. And it's going to give us an output. And we're going to plug the output of this NOT16 and connect it to the output of this regular NOT. So here. All right, so now this only handles one case. We have only covered one case, and we have um, 15 more to go. So I'm just going to copy-paste like that. And then, so that's four. That is eight. And that is 12. And we need two more. Hopefully my math is correct. Right, 4, 8, 12, 13, 14. Oh, no, it's not. <laughs> 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Yeah, what the heck? 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 times 4 is 16. What am I thinking? All right, so what we do is that we just run through all of these and we name them like so. So 2, 3, 4, and 2, 3. So we're taking the index 1, and index 2, and index 3. So 1, 2, 3, and we do this all the way till 16. So 4, oops, 4, what the heck, 5, 6, 7, I'm going to speed up the video.
Okay. All right, so now save the file, control S. We're gonna load it into the simulator. Load chip, not 16, where is it here? We're gonna load the test script of the same name. There we go. Run this through and we have done it correctly. Okay, so there are some people who are angry that, oh my God, there are no loops and it's the end of the world because I don't wanna see all of this stupid um, repetition. And really you're only gonna to have to do this like um, four-ish times. And after you're done with these, right, you're never gonna see them again because you're just gonna use the interface, right? Uh, later on, you're just gonna say not 16, here are 16 bits, and then give me an output. And you'll never see any of this. So I don't see what all the fuss is about. It doesn't really matter. Here are some more details on subbussing, which will not be used in project one. So not until you're done with this entire section, but it'll be used in the later sections. So come back to this video when you're in project two and three and four and etc. So let's run over them really quick. So here we have a chip named Foo, and it has an input of eight bits. So it looks something like this and an output of eight bits. Okay, so we're gonna use foo in the chip bar. And something that you need to take notice is that uh, the index starts from right to left. So A0 will take the rightmost bit and A15 will take the leftmost bit. And if you're a programmer, this is a little weird because um, 0, 0 is usually the leftmost and the uh, rightmost is usually 15. So it's the reverse in Nancy Tetris. And that's something to keep in mind. Okay, so um, when we use foo right here, um, foo takes as input 8 bits. But here we're plugging in, we're only filling in 0 through 3, inclusive, right? So 0, 0, 1, 2, 3. So we're filling in the first 4 bits first by plugging in A, 12 through 15. So here's 12 through 15. We're going to plug this into the first four here. And then later down the line, we're going to do the rest, right? So in four to seven, right over here, will be filled in with A, right? This A, two to five. Yeah, something like that. So hopefully that makes sense. And um, Foo has an output, right? And outputs an 8-bit output and here uh, we're gonna assign that to a temporary variable named X and Y and these are the um, concrete values for X and Y so yeah I will post this on github so you can run over it but anywho that's the general gist of multi-bit subbussing and um, there's an HTL um, PDF that explains this if you guys don't understand what I'm saying, and I will link that in the description. So for the multiplexer and demultiplexer gates, I found that the original lectures already explained this pretty well. So I will repost and clip them and hopefully I won't get banned. So here we go. So without uh, further ado, let's uh, start to talk about multiplexers and demultiplexers. So what is a multiplexer? A multiplexer, is a gate that uh, uh, operates as follows. There are two inputs coming in, and we denote them A and B, and there's a cell input uh, coming in so-called from the bottom. Of course, in reality, there's no bottom and left, but uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, this uh, gate diagram here. So three inputs come in, A, B, and cell. What does the multiplexer do? Well, if cell equals zero, the multiplexer outputs uh, A. If uh, a cell equals uh, one, the multiplexer outputs B. That's it. That, that's the, uh, the desired behavior of, uh, of a multiplexer. And here is the truth table of the multiplexer. We have three inputs, so we have eight different uh, possibilities. And you can convince yourself that the truth table is uh, uh, consistent with what we described before. 
We can also provide an abbreviated truth table of the multiplexer operation. Once again, if the cell is zero, the multiplexer outputs A, otherwise it outputs B. So a two-way multiplexer enables us to select and output one out of two uh, incoming uh, inputs. And this is a fundamental operation that uh, is being used uh, over and over again, both in digital design projects as well as in communications networks. So here's an example of how uh, MOOC's logic comes to play in the context of building uh, what is sometimes called a programmable gate. Now, what is a programmable gate? It's a gate that can behave in one of several different uh, ways according to our uh, will. So here's a simple program programmable gate that can act either as an end gate or as an OR gate. If uh, uh, the select bit is zero, the gate acts as end. If the select bit is one, the gate acts as OR. And here's the truth table of uh, the gate, and uh, you can convince yourself that it's uh, consistent with uh, what I said earlier. And here is how I can actually build it. I can use two gates, an end and an OR, provided, of course, that uh, I have uh, developed them uh, previously. And I can feed the A and B inputs simultaneously to both end and OR. And, uh, you know, we call this uh, before fanning out. So the A input is fanned out into both end and OR, and the same uh, treatment is done with the, with the B signal. And then I use a single multiplexer to decide, you know, if I want to output the result of the end or the result of the OR. So the user of this gate that sees on, only the uh, user, uh, only the interface of the gate, uh, gets exactly what uh, he or she wanted, a programmable gate. Uh, here's the HDL code that uh, implements uh, this particular architecture. And if you want, you can stop the, the video and, uh, and inspect this code and, uh, and make sure that it's consistent with the gate diagram. So here's an example of a MOOCs in the context of a digital design application. How do we build a multiplexer? Well, we get you know, all this uh, information from the uh, uh, system architect. And uh, we also get uh, a stub file. And what we have to do, of course, is to write the HDL code. And it turns out that we can build a multiplexer using three gates, AND, OR, and NOT, which we wire in a certain uh, uh, clever way. And the result is the desired uh, MOOCs logic. So it's up to you to figure out how to do the wiring and actually implement the desired uh, multiplexer. All right, moving along, let us talk about demultiplexer. A demultiplexer looks like the inverse of a multiplexer. It receives a single input, and based on the selection bit, it either uh, channels the input to an A output or to a B output. Okay, so it's kind of a distributor of, uh, of, uh, of a value into one of several possible uh, channels. In this example, we have, uh, it's a two-way multiplexer, so it's a relatively simple example. All the other channels get zero, okay? And uh, so the Dmux is basically an inverse of, uh, of, a, of a MUX, of a Dmux is an inverse of a, of a MUX, uh, if you don't like my pronunciation, and once again, it distributes a single input into one of several possible output channels. Once again, just like we said about, uh, like what we said about the multiplexer, demultiplexing is also something which is widely used in uh, digital design projects as well as in communication networks. And uh, we're going to get, or you are going to get uh, the stub file, and you actually have to, uh, to implement uh, the logic in HDL. All right, I'd like to give you an example of how multiplexing and demultiplexing can come to play in the context of communications networks. So here's a typical situation in, uh, uh, in uh, building a network. And uh, uh, the situation is such that, you know, we may have several channels coming in, uh, let's say channels of music or uh, several movies 
that we want to send over a single communications line. So, you know, the single line that goes here in the middle of the, uh, uh, of the slide can be 5,000 uh, kilometers uh, long, and uh, it may be uh, sort of an underwater uh, line and, uh, or a satellite uh, uh, line, and through this uh, single line, I want to uh, send multiple messages. How can I possibly do it? Well, if everything is digital, I can put a MOOCs in the sending end of our story, and I can feed the MOOCs uh, an ongoing train of 01010101. This can be done using uh, what is known as an oscillator. And because the MOOCs is going to get uh, a repetitive, repetitive train of 0101, it is going to output blue, red, blue, red, blue, red. In every cycle, the MOOCs will output you know, one bit from one of the two inputs. At the receiving end of this story, I, once again I put uh, a different oscillator, and therefore the DMOOX is going to distribute the incoming inputs according to uh, the DMOOX logic. It will, it will output blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, blue, red, and so on. So uh, this uh, uh, logic here, the DMOOX and the, the, mock, the MOOCs logic taken together enable me to braid or interleave several messages over a single communications line, which may be very expensive and, uh, uh, and therefore it pays off to, to use it for multiple messages. And by the way, another attractive thing about uh, this scheme here is that it can be completely asynchronous, right? Uh, um, they don't have to operate uh, uh, according to a master clock. You know, every one of, the, uh, of these two operations, uh, the uh, encoding and the, and the decoding operations can be done separately. Alrighty guys, so that's about it for this one. I hope these revised lectures help you guys out because I found the original ones kind of confusing at times. So yeah, anywho, thanks for watching and I will catch you in the next one.